when you've got your best body when you're really young you've got no confidence and then your body like just goes to rubbish and you're like yes I am empowered in my case obviously post breastfeeding my nipples look like a pair of gnarled dog toys Paloma babes you are back with an absolute banger we need to get into that first and foremost how to leave a man the first from your forthcoming album the glorification of sadness and you're serving up on that album collaborations by the banger load we're talking chase and status charlie poof babes what does this new era stand for and mean to you well it's about um probably the worst breakup i've ever had um, just because it's the longest relationship I've ever had. And I, I, we obviously had two kids together. So it's like the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I'm not mincing my words, am I, when I'm doing a song called How You Leave a Man? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, she's so... I wonder if what it's about. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's instructive. What happened there? Yeah. The whole album, when you go from start to finish, is basically like chronicling the stages of grief. And it goes from like the self-destructive moments to the insular moments to like the really vulnerable moments. And, and actually the kind of unusual bits for me as a female artist is like the empowered moments. Because I think quite often like people sing about heartbreak and remorse and stuff, but they never sing about like empowerment. So I feel like that's important as a feminist. When you were going on the creative process of creating this album, what did it help you process and deal with the most, would you say? The self-acceptance of the fact that like one day you might be like a feisty person being like, I hate you and I want to exact revenge. And the next day you might suddenly change your mind and you're like a mess on the floor and you're like, oh my God, what have I done? So it's sort of like the acceptance that all of those stages of recovery from massive life-changing events are acceptable and you have to like love and appreciate yourself. And I think for me, um, what I'm really enjoying about it is that even though it's been devastating and hard and all that, through the campaign, I'm managing to like sprinkle a bit of humour, like laugh in the face of adversity. It's It's like, it's quite a sort of camp response to tragedy, <laughs> but I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like that in itself is helpful to me. It's like kind of group therapy when I go online and people are like, yes, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, babes? Camp therapy needs to become a thing because the thing about life is even when you're at your darkest moments, there is always comedy somewhere around yeah. you and there's comedy to be found in really difficult situations aren't there has there been when you look back now is there a moment of real camp comedy where you've been like oh my god this is devastating but this is <laughs> the way I've reacted to this is actually comical well uh, quite often because obviously like I'm still friends with my ex because we have to be because we've got two children like I've had moments where I've, we've been speaking and it's been really harrowing, like deconstructing what went wrong and everything. And then I look up at him and we're both just cracking up. <laughs> we're like, is this inappropriate? Oh, God. <laughs> and we're just both like... <clears throat> and I was like, the other day I was like, do I look really ugly? Because <laughs> I've been crying so much. And he's just like, yeah, you look hideous. <laughs> <laughs> I find it so helpful. He just, like, we're both on that sort of same page. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, appalling. I don't know if I believe in happy endings, but I suppose subconsciously we're, like, fed them all the time, aren't we? Like, as kids and, like, fairy stories and stuff. My mum's always, my mum's absolutely hilarious about everything. She's like, never read your children fairy stories. They're damaging. The other day she sent me a message saying, I just want for the record you to know that we're not anti-men, we're just very disappointed. <laughs> I hate this expression so much in so many ways, like being a single mum, because no one's ever going to interview your partner and say, what's it like being a single dad? Because that just doesn't happen. And because he's not doing it. <laughs> How 
how has that experience of becoming a single mother, has it empowered you? And what has also surprised you about it, would you say? I'm really scared that the reason why I am one is because I was raised by one. And maybe that's why I don't sit around and tolerate stuff that most people do. Mm. Like, maybe I just go, oh, I know how it's done because that's what I've seen. So I'm not going to tolerate this. Like, I think quite a lot of people in relationships with kids probably just don't, they're just worried at how hard it would be. But it is like, it is really hard. But in some ways, it's also easier because you're not like arguing over split decisions on requests or reasons to be disciplined or whatever. You're just like, it's just you, you're... You're the boss. As with most things in life, you, there's pros and cons to everything. And you kind of flip between moments where you're like, I'm broken, I can't cope. And then other moments where you're like, I am so full of like energy and mm. passion for this situation and feel so kind of empowered by it. And I think it's, um, it's interesting. Like there are moments where you're just like, I'm overloaded. Like, the other day I was like on the way to the school and my my natural answer for everything is like yes so I'd volunteered to do a stall at this event at the school and to bring food but then I had like the two kids and other stuff to plan and some work bits to do and then I just realized like I had to just accept I can't do both I'm going to go and do my volunteering I did a stall but I'm not bringing food. And I got there and I was like, I'm so sorry, I haven't had time to cook a dish. But everyone was like, fine. <laughs> I think sometimes you like get into your head that every, you've got to do everything. You've got to be superwoman. You've got to be like this superhero person. And actually in reality, you can just like, you're kind of like, I think if you're a high achiever, which I am like, as in by default, I always want to do more. I think when I do like one or two bits less, it's sort of, st it's still a lot. And I was dressed as a Spanish woman as well. What? What was this stall? It was an international celebration of International Diversity Day at the school. Where we all had to dress up as like our heritage. And like nobody else did it. None, all the kids did, but they didn't do it in their, like the adults. And I was like, full on Spain. <laughs> Flowers in my hair, flamenco outfit, without food, but all style and no content, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Just the idea of you having like an internal breakdown while also looking like a flamenco dancer is kind of iconic, isn't it? <laughs> well, I always try and live in an iconic manner all the time. <laughs> if you're going to have I'm a breakdown, doing. babes, make it iconic. Oh my God, I feel like I've been having a breakdown for five years. I just don't, when's it going to end? <laughs> there is so much pressure that is put on us as individuals, especially externally and internally as well, especially when you are a mother. For you, have you received any kind of like sexist comments about being a working mum and the pressures around that? I always think that I'm in denial about sexism because every time I get asked these kind of questions, I go, no, no. But I do think that um, nothing direct, but there is like a sense indirectly that sort of threaded through culture so much so that you often think that it's not real or it's not happening. Mm. You know, when I first started having kids, I did notice like a difference in or a, an increase in doubt around me about whether I could still sustain a career or like, you know, sex sells and it's like, can you be sexy? And I'm actually writing a book at the moment, which I haven't told anyone, but I'm sort of in the middle of writing a book, which is going to be out next year called MILF. Yes! <laughs> it's all about this stuff um, and how there's kind of like, it's sort of impossible really to be a success as a woman in culture if you do, like without it being wrapped in the vines of the patriarchy and i do think that in the book i say the patriarchy is not just perpetuated by men it's perpetuated by everyone it's perpetuated by 
gay men, straight men, they's and them's, women, like we are so, in, it's so ingrained in us that we often have like misogynistic or sort of very patriarchal ideas about each other even. Like, you know, everything's a mm. spectrum. I have with ridiculous ingrained ideas even as an empowered woman for myself about what I should and shouldn't do like there's a it's a huge issue because we all have it in us quite often successful women get branded as like appalling mothers oh the children must be neglected or they must like lose out on that real maternal feeling there are still so many sexist labels that are pushed around our society and especially around female artists because we've talked about this on this podcast before with like Eddie Golding and Madison Beer and they said before that they felt worried about using their voice in case they got labelled a diva at different times in their career. What have you been unfairly labelled in your career do you think and how have you dealt with that? I really despised when I first came out constantly being called zany and quirky because men would never be labeled zany and quirky it's like and at the time obviously things are changing a little bit but that was you know we're talking just over a decade ago like at the time it was to do with a combination of the way I dress and the fact that I had a sense of humor and I think like people have um Realise that women can be funny. <laughs> well done. Breaking um, news. <laughs> and also, I don't think like I, I don't think being non-conformist means that you're zany or quirky. Like it's just annoying. This annoying vocabulary. Mm. 